Welcome to Dragon's Den, where deal or no deal has the potential to make or break a new business. Some entrepreneurs will leave in triumph, while others will see their hopes dashed. First to enter the den is Annie Mitchell, an entrepreneur who's brought her product all the way from the US of A. We started this business because it's something that has always been passed down in my family, and I know that Europeans will love it as much as we do. The best bottle all. So far, the dragons aren't finding the product's name a particularly easy read. Both fest hot knob pot. What are you saying, Deborah? You're now being rude. <laughs> but Annie hopes her pitch will spell success with one tycoon in particular. Peter Jones definitely has the most natural fit for us, and I'm excited to hear what he thinks about what we're doing. Hi, Dragons. My name is Annie Mitchell, and I'm the co-founder of Bottle Shot Coffee. We make cold brew coffees sold in ready-to-drink cans. I'm here today looking for 80,000 pounds in exchange for a 2% stake and help us accelerate our growth further. Consumers want convenience, but they also want it to be delicious and good for them. The problem is most canned coffees today are full of artificial flavorings, high in sugar, and low in energy. None of that is what you want from your coffee. So what's our secret? Our cold brewing process and our authentic recipes provide the perk of a delicious morning coffee without the acidity of a hot coffee. I've watched this drink go from a regional favorite into a national phenomenon in the US and I'm bringing it to Europe because I know you'll love it too. Let's taste some coffees. Cold brew coffee in a can is the offering from American entrepreneur, Annie Mitchell. In your box, we have two coffees. We have a cold brew black and one with oat milk. She's asking for 80,000 pounds in return for 2% equity in her business. Deborah Meaden is first to flesh out the coffee concept but it appears she's less than taken with the taste. Um, I've got to be honest. I don't enjoy this at all. I drink cold coffee. I make it at home. And this tastes weak. I really wanted to open that and have my socks blown off. I'd be interested. Did we like it? For my palate, it felt a bit watered down. Oh, interesting. Can I make an observation? My team in New York would have cold brew on tap, and it tasted exactly like that. Yeah. And I remember going up to it one day and trying it and going, oh, what's that, watery coffee? So I think in the UK, we have a different taste preference. We did wonder about European palates. So we did a blind taste test versus six others, and 100% actually chose ours. Annie bats back Deborah Meaden's concerns about her coffee, citing market research, giving her cold product a warm reception. However, it appears Tuka Suleiman is more preoccupied with financials than flavor. Four million valuation? Yes. Wow. OK, I'm expecting some amazing figures. We did 95,000 pounds in revenue last year. But what I would like to point out about today, we did 25,000 pounds last month alone. So I think that just shows you that there is uh, much more potential than the actual past year shows. So, okay, so your gross profit? Over the past 12 months was 42,000. And our loss was uh, 200,000. Okay, so what investment have you had? And, and at what valuation? So we've done two fundraises and our last one was with people who have expertise in coffee, distribution and venture capital. Of what the valuation? Four million valuation. Four million. So we are actually holding that today. So in total, how much have you raised for this business? In total? A million two hundred and fifty thousand. So how did you raise that money? Did you do that on your own? I did it with my co-founder, Charlotte. And have you done something before? Uh, Charlotte, Charlotte actually has. So Charlotte created a first company that was a mobile app for dining out at restaurants. She started that in 2014 and in 2017 sold it to American Express. And what did she sell that for? Uh, a little under 15 million. The revelation of a previous eight-figure success story for the entrepreneur's business partner 
has given preferred investor Peter Jones plenty to ponder. And Danny's fundraising so far appears to have caught the attention of Sarah Davies. I couldn't really give a monkeys what the other dragons think about the taste of it. Because you've come in here and said you've got a board full of coffee and drinks experts who have put a fair chunk of money where their mouth is. So, really, it's a little bit irrelevant what we think. The industry has already given it that seal of approval. Not irrelevant what you guys think at all, but I do appreciate that compliment. Thank you. But to be blunt, what is it that you want from an investor today and here? Because you don't need the cash. You've got a board with massive experience across coffee, specifically. So what are you looking for? For the actual value of helping us grow in the market. Uh, to be totally candid, I really see it as being a help us. Uh, I think it would help us. We are in, in talks with... Do you know, you're stumbling for the first time in your pitch. You have been immaculate, and you are stumbling to explain exactly what you want from a dragon. Any investment I get into, I have to sit here and think, that's my role, that's what I'm doing. Because when I make an offer, I'm valuing what I can do for a business. Right. I don't know here. got no idea. This worries me. And I don't want to go into investment worried. So, I'm out. Deborah Meaden can't see a place for herself in the business's boardroom and becomes the first dragon to decline a deal. And Tuka Suleiman is still struggling with the seven-figure price tag and he's placed on her business. You've come here with a ridiculous valuation. When's your year end? Our financial year end is October. OK, so what have you turned over in the last eight months? 60,000. And you've come in here with a valuation of 4 million. So the valuation of 4 million, we're projecting 750,000 pounds in revenue for this year. But you've only done 60,000 so far over the last eight months? Correct, in a year of, so yes, that is very true. Look, at the end of the day, it's very simple, Annie. Your valuation compared to the actual business, what you were doing at the, the moment, you know, just doesn't stack up. And for that reason, I'm out. Annie, I'm not convinced on exactly what you're here for. And I think because of that, it's not an investment for me today. So I'm going to thank you for the offer and then say I'm out. Three dragons have now given the entrepreneur's chilled coffee the cold shoulder. But Stephen Bartlett knows what it takes to scale a multi-million pound business. And it appears he spotted some serious potential in Annie. I did want to congratulate you. Raising the amount of money that you've raised before you've got significant revenues is absolute testament to yourselves. Thank you. I really do think that's because of our drinks. I think it's because of you. Well, thank you. I'll take that, too. Can you tell me a little bit about the direct-to-consumer business? We do sell online. We sell about two and a half thousand pounds per month. But I do think retail will be the foundation, and then that also helps us ignite online as well. I disagree with that. I think that in 2021, if you want to build a really valuable business, the best place to start, in my opinion, for this type of business, which does have direct-to-consumer potential, mm -hmm. is to start online, to scale that business. I'm going to tell you where I'm at. I think you're incredibly impressive. So I would completely invest in you, but I'm not prepared to invest in this business with the strategy you have. And for that reason, I'm going to say that I'm out. Annie's plans for future growth give Stephen Bartlett the jitters, and he becomes the fourth dragon to drop out. Peter Jones is the entrepreneur's last hope of investment and also her preferred investor. Does he have a different take to the dragon on his right? You've been really impressive and you're very, very credible in the way that you've been able to raise money and go out with your proposition. And I think your strategy is right. But I think what you do need is massive scale in terms of everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I have been lucky enough to sit in this chair for such a long time. And the only reason why I haven't got grey hairs is because I dye my hair. 
<laughs> Same. I've been here that long. So I understand the retail, I think, better than most. And I have been able to put products in the tens of millions into retail stores in the UK and do very good deals with people like Walmart and the Welcome Group in Asia. Now, sometimes you've got to say when you're good at something. And you know what? I don't often boast. Everybody knows that. <laughs> oh, it's the coffee. And I might need another two or three of these cans in a minute <laughs> because I'm going to be the guy that could really help you make this absolutely enormous globally. Now, I'm going to test you today by making you an offer. OK. I'm going to offer you all of the money, but I want 10% of the company. Thank you. I so appreciate that. Um... Do you want to take a sip of your coffee and reflect? Yes. <laughs> Annie's dream of making her cold brew coffee a red-hot success becomes a potential reality thanks to an offer from Peter Jones. However, in return for the £80,000, he's seeking five times more equity than the 2% the entrepreneur wanted to give away. Is there any world where you would do it for 5%? Five? I think that's a tough ask because you want me to be motivated. I do, definitely. Five percent. I think it's too small for me to get excited. I, I just don't think that we can go higher to offer more than five percent. What about if we agree ten percent and if I get my money back within 12 months, I'll drop to five percent. I think, yeah, I think we could do that. Yes! Well done. <laughs> well done. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank Congratulations. you. Congratulations, well done. Annie has done it. Having secured the £80,000 and the dragon of her dreams, she leaves the den full of beans. I feel exhilarated. I also feel like this isn't really real. I'm hoping that this means we are close to being a household name. Come on, show me the love. You're peacocking, showing how beautiful you are. That's a legendary deal and you know it. Next to enter the den are Vahid Nagori and his business partner Thibaut Denis, who has what you might say a somewhat varied skill set. I studied rocket science and then business development. I'm also world champion in Latin American formation dances and European champion. Hi. Showtime. <laughs> I'm not quite sure performing it to world championships is fully comparable to pitching to the Dragons, but it's certainly something we're really looking forward to. Dear Dragons, my name is Wahid Nagori. I'm the founder and CEO of Greenbelt Packaging. My name is Thibaut Denis, and I'm the associate director. We are here today for 150k investment in return of 7.5% equity. Plastic, merely a century-old invention and already has polluted every corner of our beloved planet. Today, single-use plastic accounts for 40% of every plastic produced annually. That's why we at Greenbelt Packaging have developed an eco-friendly and plastic-free solution. Last year, we had a turnover of nearly one million pounds. Our products can be utilized in businesses such as high street retails, superstores, pharmacies, the hospitality industry, e-commerce, and even industrial packaging. We are ready to take some questions, and you have in your boxes some samples of our products. Sustainable, plastic-free packaging is the offering from business partners Vahid Nagori and Thibaut Denis. Our plant-based packaging will disintegrate fully in boiling water. In natural condition, it will degrade in three to six months, compared to regular plastic, which can take up to hundreds of years to degrade. The duo are hoping to bag a £150,000 investment in exchange for 7.5% of their business. Resident eco-warrior Deborah Meaden is always on the lookout for planet-saving products and she wants to find out fast if this packaging proposition could be good news for the global plastic problem. Now, whoever wins this 
wins the world, because this is like holy grail. We all know that biodegradable is not the answer. It's still got plastic in it, still degrades, still tiny little bits of plastic sitting in your compost. The question is, are you the winners? So, stability. Could, could you... I've only got one hand. I am desperate to try and pull that apart. <laughs> I'll uh, take on the role of protestant. It's definitely strong. I've got my size 14s in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, talk about its stability in water, mm -hmm. its stability in heat, and its shelf life. How long can I leave it sitting there before I compromise in its strength? We retain nearly all the specification of plastic, so the strength, the elasticity, and we have a two-year guaranteed shelf life if it's stored in dried condition. How does that work, then? Because I've tried putting water on it, and inside it doesn't feel waterproof. Yeah, true. Dry conditions, a little bit water is OK, but over exposure of water, it starts like, you know? Yeah, but my big concern, particularly with our climate, mm -hmm is that when you get that delivery, they leave the bag, put it by the door, it could stay there for the day, and if it's raining, this won't hold the water, it'll just seep through. You need to resolve that. Yeah, yeah. Peter Jones's probing reveals a possible problem with the durability of the plant-based bags. Now, chief product tester Sarah Davies is eager to find out who's the brains behind this potentially game-changing product. This is fantastically impressive. Thank what you. I'm keen to know is what makes you the specialist in this area? Are you the scientist? Are you working with the scientists? So the manufacturing that we have currently and the partnership and licensing agreement we have is for 10 years, exclusive rights to supply in the UK. OK, so neither of you are the scientists behind this? No. This is somebody else's technology and product. You are licensing it to be able to distribute in the UK. Yeah. It's an Indonesian company. We have got exclusive rights for UK. The terms of your license agreement with this Indonesian company, is there minimums attached to the contract? We do not have any minimum attached to it, but we have certain clause where if there's no activity for a whole year, we need to discuss or need renegotiate for the further supply terms. So if you sell one bag, it's OK? No, 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 no. How do you define activity? It's by containers. So how many containers? There's no minimum requirement. So can they just be subjective and say, well, we didn't consider that to be activity? We need to renegotiate, we need to go through it, so it's, it has to be mutual. So say that they decided, in their opinion, there was no activity, mm -hmm. they could terminate it in 12 months? With the agreement we have, first of all, it's unique product. I'm losing my mind here because it's such a simple question and we go round the houses every time I ask it. Do you know what? I really respect the challenge that you've decided to take on because we all know that single-use plastics are a huge, huge issue. When I look at the business, however, as an investor, when someone can't answer a simple question, it always puts a seed of doubt in your mind. And that's what I'm investing in here. The value that you have as a business is this contract. And I have no idea what the terms are. And for that reason, I'm going to have to say that I'm out. An early setback for the packaging pair as a frustrated Stephen Bartlett bins their bag proposition, having failed to get a clear answer about his licensing concerns. Deborah Meaden now wants to know more about the product's planet-saving potential. Can I ask about your environmental credentials? because I think we're all a lot wiser now, so I think before somebody picks up the gauntlet and says, right, this is it, we were all going to need to know its entire life cycle. So is it a cornstarch or a...? It's a cassava starch. Oh, cassava, OK. Yeah. It's a plant. OK. Yeah. Yeah. So how much carbon is it used to turn it into this and how much water consumption? Because those are the two big measures mm -hmm. in terms of environmental impact. It grows naturally, and when we cut the plant, it again starts growing. So we can reuse it again and again. Not sure which part of the question that answered. So what's the carbon footprint of turning cassava into this? Yeah, we haven't done exact calculation on that. OK. Yeah. Um, mm. And how much water does cassava take to grow? Well, it doesn't take a lot of water because it grows with the in the humid 
environment naturally, but we haven't got the exact calculation of the water consumption. Okay, so what I feel like I'm faced with is something I would love, love to get involved with. But we've all got a lot more sophisticated when it comes to thinking actually what is the environmental impact. And what we're saying here is that you haven't really looked into that. We have got calculations for that, but I haven't got it at the moment. Really, you came into the den to sell the solution mm -hmm. to replacing bioplastics with plant-based plastics, and you haven't actually got the credentials in your head? I'm staggered. That tells me you're selling this as a commodity as opposed to an actual solution. Not good enough. Um, so I won't be investing. I'm out. Disaster for the duo as the Green Queen sees red and becomes the second dragon to decline a deal. And after pulling apart the entrepreneur's product, it seems Sarah Davies is now ready to pull apart their pitch. I look at this and I think, you are salespeople, which I've got no problem with if you're great salespeople. See, my worry is, if you can't come and sell the business on an investment proposition, I have zero confidence in your ability to go and hold up to those specialist retailers because the world and his wife is trying to solve this problem at the moment. This could be the solution. What I don't believe is that you are going to be able to go and sell it to the market. I won't be investing today, I'm out. When you came in here, I got very excited. I could make one phone call that could transform this business. Yeah. But I don't want to make a fool of myself because in order to deal with some of these major retailers, you need to have all your ducks in a row, starting from the raw material all the way up to your licensing partner from Indonesia. Yes. And to be honest with you, I'm a bit frustrated because I want to invest, but you've made it very difficult for me. So I'm out. Two more dragons depart, and Peter Jones is now the pair's last hope for investment. And it appears he's no stranger to the concept of cleaner and greener carrier bags. I do like it, I really do like it. It's a great product, and it is absolutely something that I want to invest in. I've got a little bit of experience in this. We were one of the first to come out with the eco bag that was taken on by Sainsbury's in the UK. But I worry about this licensing arrangement, because that feels like you've come in and you've got some lovely balloons, but those balloons burst really quickly when the business opportunity unfolds, and that's what I'm disappointed with. So sadly, for that reason, I'm out. Good luck, guys. Vahid and Thibaut fail to bag a dragon. And they leave the den with nothing. Wow. Wrong thinking. It was completely wrong thinking. Mm. Their proposition disintegrated like their bags. Of course, it's disappointing. But I also understand the fact why they haven't invested today. I think we have homework to do to make sure we can address those queries in, in future. The dragons are experts at exercising their business brains. But sometimes they're presented with a product that requires a different kind of workout. Hands up, sit back. Nice, looking good. The den has welcomed a wide range of sports and fitness offerings over the years. Do not break neck. Woo! And some have really got Titan heart rates racing. 30 minutes of me is enough to put a smile on anyone's face. However, back in 2006, there wasn't a pom-pom in sight when Peter Ashley popped in with his product that could give you a workout from the comfort of your living room. Looks like an ordinary chair, but within the bowels of this chair, there is a multi-gym, and these are all of the exercises that it does. Would you like me to show you it? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. Duncan Bannatyne jumped at the chance to give the fitness chair a try. This is the exercise bike. Prepare yourself for this, okay? 
Take a okay. deep breath in. Yeah, do some weight exercises at the same time. Okay, you know, just, okay calm yourself down a bit. <laughs> <laughs> but, but that's not all. That's not all? That's not all. Oh, okay. If you'd like to hold on to this and step on there, that's the idea. Now, it's a walking machine, not a running machine. <laughs> You're frightening the life out of me. <laughs> Are you okay? <laughs> like two old codgers in their living room trying to get a fit. <laughs> In 2012, professional boxer turned inventor Clay O'Shea offered up his exercise belt, Abs Pack, which helps the wearer do sit ups. How many times in the gym do you see the old neck moving? That's not a sit up, that's a neck up. So now look at this. The only thing that's moving on me now is my abs. There's loads of exercises that I've made. Once you do Abs Pack, you'll never turn back. The inspiration for Clay's invention came from his previous life on the canvas. What have you been doing for the last 45 years? I used to be a professional fighter. I was the second best boxer in Great Britain. I had over 100 fights and I come second in every one. <laughs> <laughs> the entrepreneur may have been a perpetual runner-up in the ring, but he was confident he had a winner on his hands with his exercise aid. Can I tell you who I'm talking to at the moment? I'm in early talks with the MOD, the Army boys. That in camouflage, mustard. Clay had the patter, but unfortunately, he didn't have a patent, which proved a body blow for Deborah Meaden. You're asking for an investor to value this name at £200,000. It's a great name. Abs Pack, come on! And the former boxer threw in the towel after Peter Jones dealt a knockout blow. I can't see how you could make a lot of money out of this. So you're out, didn't you? Unfortunately, I'm going to have to say I'm out. God bless, thanks. It's been emotional. Clay went home empty-handed. But tonight's next entrepreneur, Stephen Murr, is confident that his fitness invention will be absolutely in tandem with the Dragons. Yes, of course, they're going to come on board because it's an amazing product, but more importantly, it's an amazing business opportunity for them. So, fingers crossed. <laughs> Hello Dragons, uh, my name is Stephen and I'm here today to ask you for £80,000 of your hard-earned cash for a 5% stake in my small but perfectly formed business, Turbo Rocks Limited. Turbo Rocks designs, manufactures and sells rocker plates. The only trouble with riding indoors for longer is your bum. <laughs> and what I mean is that after a while, numbness can cut in and it can become a very painful experience. This is where Turbo Rocks enters the market with its game-changing rocker plate, the real plate. It allows the rider to ride indoors for much longer. And you get much more of a sense of riding out on the road. Turbo Rocks has been trading for about two and a half years, and we've seen incredible growth over the last 12 months of 670%, selling over 1,000 units worldwide. So, come on, Dragons, who would like to join me and rock all over the world? Would anybody like to have a go on one of our rocker plates? Debbie, would you like to have a look? Probably not. Oh, no, no, no. An indoor cycling aid that provides a realistic riding experience is the offering from Somerset-based Stephen Moore. There we go. Oh! Uh. <sighs> He's looking for £80,000 in exchange for 5% of his business. Have you ever ridden a bike before? Yeah, I have. <laughs> it doesn't feel like I have, though. Stephen Bartlett is done with his demo. Oh! And Deborah Meaden is first out of the blocks with the questions. So, Stephen, thank you very much for that. My first question is for Stephen to my left. OK. Because I want to know how close to a bike was it. Um, very close to a bike. But I personally would prefer my Peloton because I don't want to be fighting with the stability. I, I want to enjoy myself and relax. And I felt like that was, as a more casual rider, was much more difficult just to relax on. And I guess it's personal preference. Uh, absolutely. But there's no reason why they there can't be the crossover there. Deb, you, you are down. Did you just call me Deb? Deborah, sorry. 
Just so you know, you started off with a Debbie, you got away with it once. Now you've shortened it to Deb. If you call me D, you're going to be out of those <laughs> lift doors faster than you can say like. Deborah. OK. Thank you, Deborah. <laughs> Apologies. So you've sold a thousand units already. How are you selling them? Almost every single one of them gets sold through our website. And how much do they sell for? Anywhere from 250 to 499. And how much are they costing you to make? So the, the most popular one at 499 cost me 141 pounds. And where are you making them? In my garden shed. <laughs> Lots of great things start in yeah, people's garden shed. That's fine. <laughs> Deborah Meaden discovers the entrepreneur doesn't need to get on his bike to get to his product's production line. But a sector-savvy Tuka Suleiman is more preoccupied with Stephen's background than his back garden. I'm just fascinated by you. So tell me about you. I've been a salesman for most of my life, actually. Selling what? First of all, a little bit of insurance and washing machines and tumble dryers. Yeah. I've worked in the Wimpy, flipping burgers for a little bit. Wow. OK, so I'm in the cycling world. Yes. What I want to know with this is the scale of the market yeah. and how many orders are you getting outside of the UK? All right, so the global cycling market no, is... Don't give me that. I know the global cycle market is huge, but what I'm saying is the scale of this product. So indoor cycling has really, really grown over the last few years with a global value that's going to grow to roughly one billion pounds. The challenge, and, and this is kind of why I'm here really, is to get some help with international shipping and, and distribution, you know, the global market. This is the key place to go, I think. That's really interesting. Now, could we get down to business? What did you do last year? Revenue was uh, 365,000. Yeah. With a net profit 135. What have you done with all the profit? Is it still in the garage? Yeah, it must be, because it's not, it's not in my pocket or I haven't spent it. I have a part-time job as well. I work, and I still do, three days a week in the local bike shop. And you don't own that? No, 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 I'm, I'm a salesman. I'm just a lowly salesman. Why do you do that? You've got a business for 50% of your time in the year that produced 135,000 net profit, mm. and you have go to work in a bike shop for the other 50% of the time. That makes sense, and, and I know that. Are you lonely? Yeah. The last 12 months, I have been locked away in my little shed in the garden. What I speak to is, is the radio. So actually getting out into the bike shop is a great way of me, you know, speaking to people and good for the mind and everything else. No, I get that. Gives you what you need. You come back, you've then got motivation to carry on doing your, your work. Yeah. But also, it's been busy in the bicycle industry. That They've not had the right number of staff in the bike shop and I just wouldn't leave them under, understaffed. Stephen candidly reveals his reasons for holding down a job outside of his business despite his company making a six-figure profit in the past year. And Stephen Bartlett has some concerns regarding the effect being a part-time entrepreneur could have on scaling a global enterprise. How ambitious are you? I'm very passionate about my brand, and I think... Um, I, I, yeah, I'm pretty ambitious. Give me a scale of your ambition for this business over the next three years. I'm absolutely dedicated, and, and, and this is going to make it over the next three years. You say absolutely dedicated, but that sits in contrast to spending half of your time working in a bike shop. Yeah. When you invest in someone, you're desperate for them to go all in because that's my money. Of course. And I want to return, so I want to back someone that believes in the scale of the opportunity. So they want to give everything to it. Yeah. So my question is, why didn't you go all in? It's one of those things where it's only really now that I've understood what the overall potential market is. It's just getting bigger and bigger, but in my mind, it's, oh, yeah, but this will ease at some stage, surely. But that easing stage never really and happened. Did you see that? You saw it getting bigger? Yeah. Why didn't you go for it? Yeah, I, I know, and, and, but, but now I do, obviously, clearly. You're still working in the bike shop today? Yes, yes. Why haven't you gone for it? <sighs> um, I, I, I will, and I need to, and I understand that. All of this creates a really clear picture for me that you're an entrepreneur that isn't dedicated to scaling this business with the aggression that I would need as an investor to make a return. So, I'm going to say that I'm out. Stephen Bartlett feels that his namesake lacks the motivation needed to take his business to the big time 
and becomes the first dragon to walk away from the cycling proposition. Can Deborah Meaden get the entrepreneur's pitch back on track? I know you think you want an investor, but I'm not entirely sure that you do. Wanting to do what you want to do, being loyal to your current employer, not giving that job up, that isn't a bad thing, it's just a different thing to what is needed when you're making an investment. And I kind of don't want you to change that. But I am aware of that, Deborah, and that's why... But you're I not, be here you can today. say the words and you can think it, but you haven't felt it. When I sit in this chair, I am trying to understand the motivations of the person standing in front of me. So I'm really sorry, I won't be investing, I'm out. I admire anybody that out of their garage has created a business that's turning over several hundred thousand pounds. However, I wonder whether you've had a real window of opportunity, lockdown has occurred, your sales have gone through the roof as a result of that, and now these main players will create something similar that will just take your, your sort of lunch away. So sadly, I'm out. Two more dragons step away from a deal. But it appears Sarah Davies believes she knows just what's needed to give Turbo Rocks a turbo charge. You don't want an investor. I do, Sarah. Sarah? Did you call her Sarah? He did. You know what? I'm going to just go now. <laughs> Thank you, Dragon. There's, There's the door if you want, Stephen. <laughs> you, you don't want an investor. You need a business partner. I agree with that. The product I feel excited about because I appreciate the huge growth in the market. So on that basis, I am prepared to make you an offer. OK. Now, usually, as a business partner, we'd go 50-50. However, you're bringing 135 grand retained profits, and I'm bringing 80 grand. So on that basis, I think a fair offer would be all of the money, 80,000, for 35% of the business. OK, Sarah, thank you very much for that. Finally, an offer on the table as Sarah Davies proposes a partnership. But in return for her cash, she's asking for seven times more equity than the 5% Stephen is willing to give away. Tuka Suleiman already has a bike business in his portfolio, so will he join the investment race? I like your enthusiasm, but I think you need a partner that is probably a bit more hands-on, because there's some fundamentals that need to be sorted out first. But yeah, it sounds interesting. So... Hmm... OK, I'm going to make you an offer. But my offer's not going to be as good as Sarah's, because I'm going to want more than 35% of the business and I know what I can bring to the party. So my offer is 80,000, but I want 40%. Thank you, that's wonderful. I'm so pleased I've got two offers. Um, OK, um, is this where I now can... Talk on the wall. the wall, is it? Thank you, please bear with me. So two potential deals for Stephen to deliberate over. In exchange for the 80,000 pounds he's asking for, Tuka Suleiman wants eight times the 5% equity that's on offer, while Sarah Davies is asking for a slightly smaller 35% stake, leaving the entrepreneur with a difficult decision to make. Um, trouble I've got is, is, is you know, 40 or 35% is so far away. Come back to me a little bit. I understand that, obviously, the bigger slice of the cake that you guys have got, the more engaged you're going to be, so I, I fully get that. So but it's I... not just that, Stephen. It's the fact that what you need from me isn't £80,000. <laughs> it is me to establish a business strategy, to work out the global commercial strategy, and then, with all due respect, mm. probably to go and execute most yeah. of it. Look, you could say, I'm going to remain on my own, not take an investment, be in my garage and carry on. Yeah. 
Yeah. That you can do. Yeah, no, I've, I've, that is your prerogative. Can. Yeah. Or catapult yeah. yourself. Yeah. That's your decision. Yeah. I'm not budging. But 40%, I'm not budging. <laughs> come on, it, it almost would be remiss of me not to, you know, ask you guys to, to come towards me. Let me ask you a question, Sarah. Would you share? 20 each? From my point of view, I have aspirations to get into the cycling market. I'm not there. Two is. Yeah. And I think that adds an awful lot of weight. So the decision you need to make, because if this was a share, it would be at the 40% valuation to give us 20% of the business each. That is the deal I would share on. OK, look, I think you're really helped me on this journey, so I can't believe it. I think we should do it. Great. Great. Awesome well stuff. We've got a deal, Stephen. <laughs> Welcome to the bike business. <laughs> oh, Sarah. Ooh. Thank you very much. It's a double deal for Stephen. He leaves the den with two new business partners and £80,000 in the business bank account. You've got to press the button, Stephen. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Oh, you got the name right, too. This is going to be the start of a great relationship. Hopefully, his garden shed has room for three. Can't believe it. it uh, uh, didn't see that coming at all. They were just dropping like flies. And all of a sudden, two brilliant dragons together. Oh, it, it's absolutely like a dream team. I can't believe it. Last to enter the den are Matt Crate and Melody Tron a duo who were destined to join forces in business. You got this. And we worked together a year and a half ago. First time I met her, I said, we need to, we need to remain friends. We're going to work together again when we start a company one day. <sighs> and I was like, oh, that's an odd statement. And then, you know, <laughs> Here we are, co-founders. Matt and Melody think they've come up with a concept that could revolutionise the way we donate to charity. We're innovating giving and we're bridging the gap between young people and charities. People do want to do good. It's just it needs to be easy. Hi, Dragons. My name's Matt. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Toucan. And I'm Melody, head of product and also co-founder of Toucan. And today, we're asking for £85,000 in return for a 3% stake in our business. The year 2017 was the first time that millennials became the largest giving group in the UK. But there's a problem. In a world that's going through digitalization and moving online, this sector is still catching up. How can we expect to engage this modern generation without a modern solution? Toucan is an app that makes giving proactive, flexible and fun. Toucan allows users to create a flexible giving portfolio, which is one donation split across multiple charities, and you can change your portfolio whenever you like. You can restart, alter, or pause your giving to suit you. An app aimed at charity-minded millennials is the offering from business partners Matt Crate and Melody Trong. As you can see, there's three charities in my portfolio, so I'm now going to set up my monthly donation, £15 a month in total, split three ways. They're seeking £85,000 in exchange for just 3% of their company. And lastly, sharing. You can share charities, the causes, and you can encourage others to follow your lead. And that's Toucan. The duo's platform may have giving at its core, but Deborah Meaden is wondering about the D word that's the holy grail of the tech world. Matt, Melody, hi. Can you tell me who owns the data? If I'm fundraising as a charity, somebody comes onto my site and makes a donation, I've got that data. And that is the lifeblood of my charity. So who owns the data in this instance? We own the donor data. We do not pass that on to the charity. And that's one of the selling points to users to our application. When we dug deep systematically into the problems, one of the things that people worried about was being constantly pressured for donations. And effectively, we do act as a firewall. I completely get that, but charities spend millions of pounds trying to make sure that they can communicate with them, they can update them, they can build relationships with yeah. them, and what you're doing is de-relationshipping. 
how many charities have you got signed up at the moment? We've got 20,000 charities automatically enrolled with Toucan. Oh, we right, do... so as a charity, whether I like it or not, you can put me up on your site? Yeah. Blimey, I'm not sure how I feel about that. The way that we're structuring the business is that, you know, we're effectively a marketplace, you know, joining donor with charity. We then send an email to that charity stating, there's a donation coming for you, there's no fees for it. If you don't want to receive it, please let us know and you're, and you're free to come off the platform if you'd like as well. Matt stands his ground against some Deborah Mead and scepticism about the way his outfit operates. Now, Stephen Bartlett wants to know how the duo are converting charitable millennials to their platform. Can you tell me one of the ways that you're acquiring users? So there's influencers, corporate partnerships, users and charities. So I'll give you an example of an influencer, OK? You know, your world. Say, for example, you, the influencer, have a charity that you want to support. We give you the ability to promote online. And if I'm a user and I click on what you've posted, and when I download Toucan, within my portfolio is your charity. So it gives you, the influencer, the ability to use your power for good. So all of my followers have the chance to join a community of givers on a recurring monthly basis? 100%. Creators and influencers want to be charitable, but starting a charity and running a charity is tremendously difficult. Yeah. So Zoella, Alfie Days, Joe Wicks, what you've got here is you have the chance to give them the tech infrastructure to run their own digital charity. That's exactly it. Yeah, pretty good. The app's ability to increase fundraising by syncing with influencers and their followers seems to have hit the spot with a social media savvy Stephen Bartlett. But Tuka Suleiman is more interested in how the company makes money for itself than how it raises cash for others. Look, um, this is a business. Yes. This is not a charity. Yeah. Right? Let's get down to business. If I put in £10... Yeah. ..how are you going to make money? 100% of your donation goes to the charity and our revenue is on top of the donations. We charge a fixed fee of 50 pence. We ask you, the user, to contribute 4, 6 or 8% of your donation on top of that. So £10.90 would leave your account if you chose 4% of the contribution. So the higher my donation, the higher your fee. The fixed fee remains and yes. OK, look, I'm going to break cover here. You know, I'm one of these rebel dragons, always thinks out the box. <laughs> so what this really needs to super boost this is five dragons. Therefore, I'm very willing to offer you one fifth of the money for 5% if all the other dragons come along. So you would give up 25%. Thank, thanks for the offer. Thank you, too. Tuka Suleiman becomes the first to make a play for Matt and Melody's business. But unusually, his offer is reliant on the other four investors to his left, joining him in a five-way dragon deal. As the founder of his own charitable foundation, Peter Jones is no stranger to giving to good causes. But is he ready to put his hands in his pockets for the duo's offering? I think it's really clever what you've done because you are thinking about how to now engage people like me, the charity, yeah. with a user group that would never have come to my foundation in the first place. Yeah. So this is now a huge revenue stream that I would never have had without your existence. Yeah, he's exactly right. Yeah. So I'm going to make you an offer. I'm going to offer you all of the money, 85,000, for 10%. However, the most important thing is you need awareness. So I'm very, very happy to share that at 2% with my fellow dragons, because I wouldn't say one, because Tuka won't get out of bed for it. So that would mean 17,000 at 2%. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, Peter. And I believe what we can bring to the party is advocacy and awareness. So if that offer fits within your structure, then I am more than willing to join the cause on that basis. Thank you so much. So, guys, you do need a rounded approach to this. So I'm also very happy to share in a bigger offer that takes on board all of the dragons. 
at 2%. You guys, you're a pretty impeccable team. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. So I am going to make you an offer. I'm going to offer you all of the money for 10%. But I'm also willing to split that five ways amongst my fellow dragons. So you've just got potentially five dragons to invest. How many people have done that? Thank you so much. Do you want to go to the wall yeah, and have yeah, a chat? We'll go to the wall. Thank you. A rare turn of events as all five dragons offer to team up on a deal for Matt and Melody's charitable act. This is insane. It's all five dragons. But they're asking for a combined 10% equity in exchange for the £85,000, more than three times the 3% that's on offer. This is like probably better than we expected. <laughs> Peter Jones and Stephen Bartlett are also open to a solo investment for the same equity ask. But it seems Matt and Melody are hoping all the dragons will be a bit more charitable. Hey, thank you so much for all your offers. It means everything to us. Our five-year plan stipulates a million donors in five years. Can we arrange an agreement whereby we accept a level of percentage if you get us to that million donors within, say, two years. If you don't, you come down to what we asked for. Um, I, I'm going to say 100% no. And i tell you why. If we help you to get to the million, I want double, genuinely. I think you're working at this the wrong way. I think it's a very, very, very good offer. The barrier in my mind is I need to go away with both sides feeling like they've won. Five dragons, that's what you want. Very rare, five dragons. Have you got a counter offer other than the illogical one you came back with? I, I did not want to leave here today giving away more than 5% in the business. Is there anything that will you guys come in on your, on your percentage? I really don't want to walk away from this deal. I really want a dragon. It's not looking good dragons. for you, Matt. Mm. There's not much we can come down. We're in 2% each. Yeah. Um, I'm going to put my neck on the line. Stephen, when I found out you were coming on the den, we had to get in front of you because I thought this would resonate. We want you in the business. We came here for you. Can we agree something where you come down? Can we meet at 5%? I think that's meeting. I started at 10. I think we're going to start to make it a bit easier for you, Matt and Melody. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out too. I'm out too. OK. I can't give 10% of the business. Can we agree something where you come down? 7%. What you actually need is me, like, in your office, in there with the team. You want me in front of your investors? I'm not going to do it for, like, 3%. To be completely honest, there's people offering me 3% just to be on their boards, right? So for 7%, I think that's fair, and I think the value that I can add is proportionate. Done. Amazing. Thanks so much. Matt and Melody have done it. You should be so proud of yourself. The charity app entrepreneurs leave the den with the £85,000 they were seeking. And a master of millennial marketing on board with the potential to catapult their fundraising platform into the corporate stratosphere. I think it's safe to say we're feeling pretty good. Yeah, that was <laughs> like so unexpected. I, I, I can't even speak properly. Well done. Thank you, appreciate it. Thank you. So Stephen Bartlett clinches the deal for the charity app, which joins a cycling rocker plate and cold brew coffee on tonight's investment podium. 
Winning isn't everything, but when it leads to a partnership with a dragon, it certainly gives an entrepreneur and their business a fantastic opportunity to go for gold. Oh! Next time on Dragon's Den. <laughs> yes. It's quite strong. Oh, wow. Sorry. <laughs> it's quite emotional for me. I don't think she wants to take any questions. Oh, my God, you're an animal. Were you listening to what I said? You said I can't do it. Test me. God, you guys are doing my head in. I'll drink to that.